Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was here two years ago, and I came, didn't, hadn't been before, just came bollocking in, did my thing, not nervous, no bother, didn't know how inspirational, how awe-inspiring it was, no stress. Today, slightly different. <laughs> I know how high the bar is, and what's worse, I only got a phone call on Monday asking me to be here to do, to do this, so it's been a bit stressful, but lovely nonetheless. I, I love do because lots of reasons. One, you sit here and you think, wow, they're brilliant. Why can't I be like them? And I've got a new hero from these, like these first few days, and that's Steve Edge. The man's a miracle, a marvel, and if I can look like that from tomorrow, I will. That's how I'm going to dress. <laughs> Need to lose a little bit, but other than that, I think it's easy. <laughs> I'm not pressed start yet, so my time's not going, OK? That's, that's the rules. Um, the other reason that I love do is because it's like an old school eyeball meeting with CBs, you know? Because I'm now seeing my Twitter friends for the first time, some of them. Documentally, Christian, wherever Christian is. I, I have got real friends as well, I hasten to add. I don't have <laughs> all my friends. And Christian and I were drinking on the first night, knowing full well that we were in the same tent and that there was another person in that tent called Tom, who was a bread man. And I make my own sourdough, you're going to see that in a minute. And um, so we rocked up back to the tent, Christian and I, trying to be really quiet whilst trying to keep down four or five pints. And um, Tom was pretending to be asleep, and we walked in, and then he said, oh, no, it's all right, I am really awake. I said, oh, you're the bread man, I make my own sourdough, bore, 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 bore. And um, he was really polite and really lovely. And I said, oh, yeah, by the way, there was this brilliant program on Channel BBC4 about bread. And there was this amazing guy. And it just, it was fab. Did you see it? And he said, no, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> I was a, in my, my defence, it was pitch black. <laughs> so I couldn't see what he looked like. Uh, but I, I felt so humbled. So thank you for being gentle with me and not making me feel a right ass. OK, so <laughs> it's not sufficient to do things better. We need to do better things. What, what does that mean? We need to do things better as well, surely. Possibly. I've spent my last 20 years doing things better, and I want to change that. I want, I want to do something different. A little bit about me. I'm really grumpy. I'm 43. I'm allowed to be grumpy at 43. You're not allowed to be grumpy at 23. You're allowed to be even grumpier, Andy, when you get into your 90s, and you write letters in. And that's great. I've got four kids. That one of them going to college next year. I know I don't look old enough. Um, I've got two dogs. I've got a really long-legged, elegant collie, and I've got a really short, wiry, um, aggressive, fat Jack Russell. Which one's mine? <laughs> I've got eight chickens. I love chickens. If you do one thing when you get home, this is, you've got lots of little do's. Get chickens. You don't need any space. You just need to give them love, and they will love you back with food. They're just... You don't eat them. You get, you get the eggs. <laughs> Chickens, chickens of the future. I, you've heard it here first. I've also made the mistake of buying four running ducks. Does anybody own running ducks here? What's the running? A, a running duck is a very skinny, tall duck. They're Indian, so they like the warm weather. Why I bought them in Derbyshire, I don't know. And they just run around like this. <laughs> they, do, they don't do anything. And they compete to be furthest from whoever's talking to them. So it's, like, no, it's not me. It's not, it's not me. And, I, and I'll be honest, I fucking hate them. I hate them <laughs> with a passion. But my wife loves them. She wants to breed them. So, so we take the most unsociable animal in the world, other than maybe an alligator, and we try and breed them. No, it's wrong. They were going in the bin, well, in the, in the pan, till last week when... The, I know, I know, but they haven't laid any eggs. They're 20 weeks old, I've got no eggs. I'm, I feed them, they feed me. That's the deal. <laughs> They've not kept their end of the bargain up. So it goes, but they're all, yeah, obviously, they're all being big. <laughs> but yeah, they've now, they've now laid, thank you, yeah. I'm not that much of an idiot. They've now laid, and the eggs are beautiful, so they, they, get, they, they get a respite. I'm not eating the cats, although they are bloody stupid. Um, I've got an admission to make, and I'm, I'm going to say this really proudly right in the front. I am indie. <laughs> I, I am indie. I love indie. I love skinny white boys who can't hold social relationships down, playing guitars. I love it. I love it. This is my... Well, these were my favourite band. I'm going off them a bit now, because lots of people like them, and I'm a bit elitist like that. So I'm moving on, OK? And I need to find the next skinny white band. You, you all know who these are, don't you? Oh, you do? Look. <laughs> do 
you know what? I actually quite like McFly. Because, no, I'll tell you why. Because my kids grew up liking Steps. And then Busted and McFly, we'll hear more about Busted later. Busted and McFly came on the scene. And I think if you start with Steps, you can only ever end up with ABBA. If you start with McFly, you might end up in the White Stripes. Well, not in the White Stripes, but with the White Stripes. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good thing. This is the drums, New York band. Okay? They sound a bit like Smiths-ish, but they're getting a bit popular, so I'm going to try and find somebody else to move on to. I might find someone really obscure, a Welsh band or something like that, I don't know. <laughs> Um, I've got really shit taste in shoes. These are a pair of leopard skin creepers. I'm wearing a pair of um, sky blue kickers today. Um, I think life's too short to wear crap shoes. Um, and I'm a really proud builder of an outdoor pizza oven. I'm so proud. I built this without any plans or any knowledge or anything. I barreled into um, Forest. I bumped into James and said, I bought a, pe a built pizza oven. He said, how did you do it? So I said, well, I built it out of concrete. And he said, well, what, what, what have you used to support it? I said, nothing. <laughs> I just put sand in it and I covered it in concrete and I took the sand away. Well, hey, it stayed. And he said, well, have you used special heat-resistant concrete? I says, no. He says, well, it'll fall down. I says, I don't care. I love building it. <laughs> and, and, and I'll build it again when it falls down. I will take James's advice and do all the things that I should have done. And, it, and it's fantastic. And I'm going to also bake some bread in there as well. <sighs> Sourdough bread. You've all tried it now, haven't you? You've all been on the workshop. It's, it's the gift that keeps giving. You keep the eleven going, it keeps multiplying. It's beautiful. Make some sa do, small do number two. Make some sourdough bread when you get home. Okay, what do I do? My, my, my mum doesn't understand what I do. My nan, who's 89, stand, understands even less. But when I got my big job, the one that I'm still known for, old Mark, he used to work for Asda, for our American colleagues, that's part of Walmart. Um, they, they, they understood that. Mark works for Asda. And so, and I'm still known when I speak, oh, Mark, ex Asda. I was only there a year. I, I, I didn't like it. <laughs> so they're a fine business, but they're not for me. But it's funny how you become known for one thing and, and one thing alone. So I, I used to work there, and then I had enough, and I left. And I went to move to Australia with my kids. And my wife, we're in, we're in New Zealand actually, checking out a job there. And she found a lump in her breast, and we. We're miles from, from home. And for the first time, I had to define what home was because we felt really isolated, really isolated in Christchurch, really cold. And we thought, flip, what are we going to do? We're going to go home. We were living in, in Leeds and our family are in Leicester. So we thought, well, we'll move, we'll move back to Leicester. That's what we'll do. But I'd sold everything. Sold the house, sold the cat, given up work. I'd, I'd, you know, you kind of nothing, cut completely free. And, and it was really scary, and she was fine. I better get that bit in first. She was absolutely fine. I had biopsies and stuff. But, but I thought, well, I can start again. I can completely change. I can change my name, midlife crisis. I can do whatever I want to do. And that was so liberating, it was untrue. And uh, we had nothing, so risking everything was not a problem. It didn't, it didn't matter. What, what could I lose? Not the big job, not, not the big title, because I'd already given them up. Brilliant. Because I think that the only, the heaviest bag we've got is, is fear, is, is fear of change. And I've been speaking to someone today who's just given up her job with, with Google. She's here somewhere. Thank you. And, and it's really scary, isn't it? But it'll be brilliant. It'll be a fantastic journey. And I, I, there's a phrase that I use a lot increasingly, and that's about ships. I don't want to talk in, in little analogies all day, but, but I probably will. Um, where's the safest place for a ship? In a harbour. What are ships supposed to do? Sail. Fucking sail. Get out of the harbour. Get out of the harbour, get into the wind, sort it out. So, what do I do? I, I had to start a business, obviously. I had to get some money in, I had to buy a house, do all the normal stuff. So, um, I started a consultancy, and I'm an eco-designer. I, I design products and packaging. I sit between the designer and the, and the customer and the manufacturer, and I tell them all what to do which is a brilliant job. And um, I reduce carbon. I, I make really bad things a bit better. So I reduce the weight of products. I reduce the carbon footprint, in a, carbon footprint of products, the water footprint of products, and, and, I, and I save money. And it goes something like this. I'm not going to go through this um, um, slowly. £85 million pounds saving. Interestingly, that's what my clients want to hear. Carbon savings? Yeah, 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 yeah. How much money will you save us? That, and that's one of my big issues. So I've saved loads of cash. I'm not on a, on a percentage, irritatingly. Um, I've, oh, dear, in me, the really contrast on that. Shocking, isn't it? Um, 
This one went with Belkin, saved Belkin 3.5 million. This one went with Dorset Cereals, saved them a quarter of a million, helped sell the brand better. I didn't design the box, by the way, I just took all the unnecessary rubbish out of it. Uh, worked with Indesit, three and a half million savings. Glambia up in Anglesey, Anglesey people will know Glambia. Loads of work with them on, on, on reducing packaging. Really simple stuff. Management consultancy, actually, really. You don't need to know anything about environment. You just need to know about getting people to change their minds. That's what you need to know about. Um, some work with soap, um, Swafiga, savings of 800,000 just from, from being sensible. Uh, a super large online retailer who must remain nameless. Um, £600,000 saving just, just for one depot, just from, from thinking differently. Big electronic company, 3.2 million to date savings. That's bottom line. That, that, that's, that's a big thing. I'm, I'm good at this. this is, I find this easy. It's not, it's not challenging. I don't know why they've not spotted it before, but they haven't. So I walk in and charge them bugger all to save them loads of money. Um, same thing with a, a small company in the Midlands called Celestica. Um, savings of over one, 1 million. Tiny businesses as well. I work with really small businesses in Leamington Spa. 140k. They are a 10% profit business. So 140k saving is the equivalent of 1.4 million pounds worth of new sales. And when you look at it like that, even for, you know, for a small business, that's shed loads, I think the technical term is. Um, <laughs> a load of work on, 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 on the food industry, lightweight and that kind of, uh, That's what I do. It, and it's great. And I'm good at it. But it's not good enough. It's, it isn't good enough for me to do that anymore. I feel vaguely dissatisfied. No, I'll stop there. I feel very dissatisfied that I'm just chipping bits off. I'm not really making the big change. I don't think it's sufficient to do stuff better. Sometimes to do bad stuff a bit better. That's not really what, what I'm all about. So I want to do better stuff. So I'm working on, on other things now. Some really interesting stuff. I'm working with a housing company. To They got me in to talk about solar, to talk about ground source heat pumps. And, and I pitched to them. I did a presentation. And they said, actually, we'd like you to redesign the way we live. So a little brief then, just a very small brief for me to deliver, well within my capability as an environmental consultant. A fantastic piece of work, amazing, amazing company. And, and, and it's been brilliant, designing better, better homes, using space better, make, making things flexible, designing what people want rather than what architects tell you that they want. So there's a whole kind of inclusive design process that's going on here. And the key thing, I spend a lot of time talking to the residents. And what, what bowls me over, when they move into one of this, this company's houses, a company called, it's called Gen 2, it changes their lives. It's not a new house. We move house, it's a new house. They move house, they don't have people pooing through their letterbox. They don't have crime. They don't have holes in the city. It changes their lives. But these guys aren't building homes. They're, they're building hope. And, and it's, it's a really interesting product service, Nexus shift, all that kind of hairy bollocks. But, but that's, that's what, what, what it is. And they're building Code 6 homes that aren't just for demonstration. Code 6 is the most sustainable, almost like a passive house. They're not just demonstrations. People are living in them and they're working. And, and I, working with these guys has, has made me touch hundreds of thousands of people that are working with the larger organisations that I've been with before. Hasn't really. Working with RS Components, really fascinating business, massive, massive business and I'm, I'm helping them save money but I'm also helping them reposition themselves. RS Components, they're an online retailer of electronic bits. It's not going to change the world is it? But they can. There's a whole load of stuff kicking off about conflict materials, we all hear about peak resource use. All of these things are changing the way we live and changing the way we do business and if we're going to maintain a manufacturing base in this country we need to be able to get hold of these raw materials. It isn't just about their scarcity, it's about the geopolitics of these things, who controls them. So, so working with these, these, this company to move them away from being radio spares through being, that's what RS stands for, reliable suppliers, to being responsible suppliers, changing the way they look and the way they feel and how it feels to be in that business. This is really quite deep culture change, a massive challenge, but I, you know, I love it, I bloody love it. Um, I'm working on brand with lots of companies. And when I say brand, everyone, a lot of people just think logo. Brand's about your ID, it's about the, the, the tone of voice. But more importantly for me, it's about the things that you do. It isn't just about the way you tell the story of the things that you do. If the things that you do are wrong, your brand will never be good. Never. So I'm trying to work back up to change the way that people do what they do. You have to have a very authentic attitude within your business. And I want to start putting businesses right. 
not, not, not saving carbon, that's great. Not saving money, not saving water, but putting businesses right, organisations right. And brands are really interesting. You can't control it. Adidas are a really fascinating brand. They've got some great product, um, they've got some great celebrity relationships. David Beckham's an interesting one. Snoop Dogg and some of the rappers, also interesting for different reasons. They hit numerous people. All of that money, all of that good stuff gets wiped out when they get a photograph like that from, from the riots because that brand is now associated with, and I don't make it any better, do I, by repeating it to <laughs> millions of people on the, on the web. Um, but you, you can't control where your brand appears, but you can make great products. If you start with the thing that you do, if you do astonishing things, then your brand is safe. If you don't do astonishing things and try and persuade people that you do, then your brand is not safe. And, and that's what we need to get to. And I don't, you know, brands are very, uh, there's some brand agencies in the audience, I know there is. It's a very um, fluffy or, 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 or intangible part of your company worth, but it's really bloody important, really important. And, and we, need to, we need to start start at the beginning and make great stuff, things that you're proud of. David, David Hyatt calls it your rocking chair moment when you're at the end of your life and you sit back and you think, am I proud of what I did? You're rocking away there. I'm a proud of what I did. Don't put your fingers under the rockers of a rocking chair. I learned that. Really, really hurts. <laughs> really hurts. And make sure there's no cats around. Um, are, are, are you proud of, 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 what, of what you've done? Are you really proud of what you've done? And I, I listened to Caroline this morning. And it almost brought tears to my eyes. I've got four children. Completely unsustainable, I know. Um, and I, we've had, we had awful... I say we. What do I just sat and watched. Um, my wife had very difficult labours for the first three, and then a beautiful labour for the third one. No, no pain, two hours, all controllable. But in the middle of this labour, I'm, I'm at the front end. I'm not I'm happy down the business end in this, in this thing. I'm at the front end, and she's looking at me, and um, she, she reaches to grab hold of my leg, and she misses. <laughs> uh, and she gets me by the testicles quite harshly. And I don't know if there's an, there's an African tribe, if you, I mean, if you heard this story, that, that tie a twine from the from, the, from the, the, the expectant mother to the father in the other room around his, around his, his doings. And, um, <laughs> and when she's in pain, it pulls his and he... Oh, and he, so he shares the pain with her, right? <laughs> it's true. I've heard this story. I, I believe it because Anita Roddick told it. That's not a name-dropping. I was in the audience. And I know exactly what that individual felt like because I was... And every time she had a contraction, she gave him a... <laughs> undergarments a squeeze. <laughs> Agony, agony. But I sat and watched Caroline. Sorry, I'm a bit drifty. I, um, <laughs> I, sat, I sat and watched Caroline, and I just thought, you're making a difference. I'm still not making enough of a difference. And I think we can all, we can all ask ourselves that, that question. I mean, that's what this is all about, isn't it? Anyway, um, I've started doing some really fascinating work with schools. I like kids. I couldn't eat a whole one, I've got to say. Um, I've got four, but I, sometimes I fail to see the creativity and the... And the enterprise that, that is brimming from, from these li li little adults because we see them as kids, not as little adults. So I've started doing some really interesting work with, with, with some schools. I'm working with a school in Derbyshire called um, Hope Valley, which is... Where do you live? I live in Hope. Yes! I'm moving there. It's beautiful. Um, and Hope Valley is a really creative school. Hope Valley has a problem teaching English and maths because the kids are so creative that they don't calm down for those subjects. They want to get straight on to art and design. They're, they're an amazing school. So we're, we're working with them. Oops, sorry, I've flicked on too far. We're working with them to connect older people with younger adults. This, and this is a fascinating piece of work. Everyone's got an older adult. Everyone's got a, a grandma, a granddad, auntie, uncle, whatever it is. But they don't talk to them. So we bought a load of these people in. I've not got the, the video. It, it wouldn't work. We bought three or four of these older people in to talk to the young kids and vice versa. Because older people are nervous of young kids as well, because they hang around in hoods, mainly wearing Adidas. <laughs> being really sinister. No, they're not at all. They're lovely. Kids are lovely, but they do wear hoods, don't they? So, so, so we, we brought these, uh, these older adults in, and we had some fantastic questions. What's it like to live, you know? Have you heard of the internet? Yeah, I do all my shopping on it. <laughs> Can you use a mobile phone? Yeah, we've got an iPhone, and I've got a Nokia. Which one, which one do you like? Are you able to get up the stairs? Of course I'm able to get up the bloody stairs. Really, really interesting, fascinating stuff. One of the kids, I ate Jamie Oliver. He stole my chips. 
No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Another one. Old people, they wear trainers with smart clothes. What's that all about? <laughs> it's what they said. It's what the kids said. And the, and the, and the, and the older adults are there to say, well, because they're comfortable. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I thought about that. They're comfortable. Well, just don't wear your, old, don't wear your smart clothes. Um, have you heard of eBay? It's like an online jumble sale. <laughs> Brilliant. It is. It's like an online jumble sale. I visit my granddad, but I don't really talk to him. So I said, the next question is, why did you visit him? Well, he gives me a pound. Really interesting. So I got these people talking, these kids talking to, to these older adults. Oh, one of the older adults said, a really amazing guy, absolutely astonishing. 79, and no, 76, and his parents only died last year. Whoa, that's ast- he's got good genes. They weren't, they weren't Hyatt genes, but they were good genes. And um, he said, I-, I walk seven miles a day, and my problem is I can't persuade old people that they're not old. They retire at 60, they sit down, they watch the telly, and they're old. They're old up there, that's all. And then he, he, was, he, was, God, he was brilliant. He's my, apart from Steve Edge, he's my second hero. Um, and we had some um, amazing, amazing characters, br- really brilliant, li- lively older people. And we came up with three ideas, interestingly, reflecting on this morning. The first idea was to come up with a health passport on, on, a, on a USB key. So when you go abroad and you've forgotten your medicine... You don't have to go through all the palaver of a checkup. You just say, this is my health passport. Last prescription was for warfarin, rat poison. So I've got a blood thinning problem. Give me the warfarin. You don't have to go through any of the, of the rubbish. And it's about medical records. Really interesting. Um, supermarket sat nav. Some of the older, older folks were saying, we can't, we, they move stuff in the supermarket. We don't know where we're going. And irritatingly, as we were developing this, Tesco launched a news item that they were going to do the same thing, which they then, I don't think they did in the end. Um, and a, a friends and family helpline, which I think was pretty rubbish, to be fair. But apart from that, these two were great. And this one got through to the national final. That, 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 that idea went through to the national final. So, so we all went down to London. They received the best feedback. They did the flash animation, the video, the mock-ups, everything themselves. It was the best idea, but they didn't win because they weren't, it wasn't within their scope to deliver. No shit, Sherlock. How can they deliver that? That relies on a third party. So they've done really, really well, and they've had loads of press, conferences around the world, design council case studies. I did well out of it. I got asked to go and do an inspirational presentation, which caused my wife to laugh with mirth for about a week. So she says, the, kid, the, kid, the kids, Mark, the dad's going to read you a story tonight. It'll be really inspirational. <laughs> <laughs> I had a week. I had a week of this. But... But it, it, I loved it. They loved it, not my kids, the, the kids there. They loved it. So I'm, I'm changing what I do again. So I don't want to do bad things a bit better. I want to do great things with business. But more importantly, I want to do brilliant things with kids. That, that's what I want to do. I don't quite know how to do it yet, but I'm not going to stop until I do it. And I like change. I love, I love change. Now, I found a really simple flow chart. You may have seen it before, and I apologise if you haven't, that, that allows you to work out if you need to change. And this is your small do, OK? It's a really simple flow chart. Are you happy? No. Do you want to be happy? No. Keep doing whatever you're doing. <laughs> Are you happy? No. Do you want to be happy? Yes. Change something. That, it, that's not hard, is it? So that's your small do. I want you to go away and just to work out where you're sitting now. I think we can probably all, most of us, probably say we're either there or we're happy. Aren't we? One or the other. Um, but do it before you get any older. Because when does the future start? It starts now. We've got, we've got to get cracking on it. The thing about the future is it happens really, really quickly. <laughs> I read a book recently, so I'm almost finished now, so those of you worrying about time. Um, we talked about the seven ages of man, woman, okay? And, and it kind of splits our ages into, ten dec- into seven decades. So we'll probably, go, we'll probably go to eight ages. And then it gives a decade a day of the week. All right? I've got these are mine. And they are that small. Um, one day for each decade. Where are you? Okay, so I'm 43. So for me, it's just before lunch on Friday. I've only got a week. I am hoping for a bank holiday weekend. <laughs> but I've only got a week. Shit. I've got to get, that made me feel sick, actually, when I read that in the book. I was like, ooh, don't like that very much. When you die, you're not going to be remembered for doing great stuff in business, for selling briefcases, for having the best turnover shop in the street. You're not going to be remembered for that. You're going to be remembered for the lives that you touch and the change that you make. 
And I've got a little motto. I've got two or three, actually. But this one, if it's not broken, break it. Start again. I love it. It's not broken. It's working really well. I don't care. Change it. You can do it better. My second motto is, life's too short for boring shoes. <laughs> it is. And my third motto, never wear hats backwards, ever. <laughs> Unless you're American, there's no need for it. Thank you.